worship the Lord through song, let us continue to worship the Lord through the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now, and we are in awe of you, Lord. You are awesome. You are the God of the heavens and the earth, and we praise your name. And Father, it is you and you alone that we have placed our faith in. And as Abram had faith for the battle, we too pray that you will give us the faith we need. Father, help us to trust you during the battles of life, during the trials that we may go through. For Lord, we know that you are with us every step of the way, and we know that your hand is always upon us. So Lord, guide us and comfort us. God, I pray for each one here today for this church. God, help us to have bold faith. A faith to boldness and courage as we live for you and we serve you in a lost and dying world. And God, as we reflect upon the beginning of this new year, Lord, as we look forward, Lord, would you do great things? Would you revive us, Lord, for we need it? Lord, would you save the lost in this community, for they need it? And Lord, would you use us as vessels? May we be your hands and feet everywhere we go. Lord, once again, we pray for the blessing upon your word as we hear the preaching and speak to us, transform us. Forgive me of my sins. In Christ's name, amen. If you have your Bible, will you turn with me to the book of Genesis? We pick back up in our study in the book of Genesis. We were going through Genesis before Christmas time, and we took about five weeks off for a Christmas sermon series, but we're back, and we're in Genesis 14, and we're looking at a man called Abram. Now, the title of the message this morning is Faith for the Battle. But in our text, this man of God, this man of faith, goes to war, he goes to battle. Now, I'm often hesitant to allegorize all of scriptures. I think that's a dangerous thing, because you can try to make the scriptures mean something that it doesn't really mean. But in regards to battles, the Bible has much to say about spiritual battles. For the Christian, we are to fight the good fight, right? We are to put on the whole armor of God. Scriptures say that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places faith for the battle. In church, we are in a spiritual battle. Now, in our own personal lives, we go through battles and trials and tribulations. We go through storms of life, and there are times of blessing and times of things are going well, and we are on a mountaintop, and odds are it's likely Some of you this morning, you're going through a tough time. Someone here this morning, you may be going through a trial. You may be going through a spiritual battle. My encouragement to you is this. Jesus loves you, so place your faith in him. Trust him every step of the way. He will never leave you nor forsake you, so fix your eyes upon Christ and Christ alone. Now, as we dive into our text, as we consider this battle that Abram will go through, the first thing we'll notice is the conflict of the kings. And it, it's a, a, a long reading, so bear with me as I do my best to pronounce these difficult names. In the days of... In, Genesis 14, 1, in the days of Amphrophel, king of Shinar, 
Ariok, king of Elisar, Shedor Leomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goin. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemibar, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Chedor Leomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedor Leomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Kornaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Amim in Shaveh, Kiriathim, and the Horites in their hill country of Ser as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to in Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazan Samer. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoer, went out and they joined ba battle in the valley of Siddim with Chedor, Leomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariat, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and some fell in them, and the rest fled to the hill country. Now, you may have heard me read those verses and say, what is going on with those names? Difficult names to understand or pr even pronounce. I struggle, I admit. But you may also ask the question, what's going on with this story? Well, let's go back. In Genesis chapter 3, we have, after God created everything, we have the fall of man in the garden. The consequences of sin is that, that death entered into the world and men were cursed. And after the fall, men were forced to live and try to, f and they were tried to figure out how to live with this curse of sinfulness. And sin progressively has gotten worse since the fall in the garden. Soon after the fall in the garden, in Genesis chapter four, the the children of Adam and Eve, the the son, Cain killed his brother Abel. The first killing or the first murder in the Bible. It gets worse, and we see in Genesis chapter 6, the sinfulness of man got so bad that God judged the entire world and, and flooded the earth, except for Noah and his family. And what we get when we get to here in Genesis chapter 14, sin has run its course, and sinfulness has gotten so bad that we have kings and kingdoms fighting against each other. Battles and conflicts, war and death, kingdoms rising against kingdoms. And sin is running its course. It began with Cain and Abel, killing, Cain killing Abel. Now we have, at a larger level, murder and killing. But a, a question I think we may want to consider, where is God in all of this? In these wars, in the death, even today there are, are wars. Where is God in all of this? Beloved, I tell you, God is in the same place that he has always been. He is reigning and ruling. Our God has set these kingdoms in place. He has set forth their boundaries. God appoints these kings according to the scriptures. And God knows what's happening is sin is running its course. And what are we to do about all this? Some would say that the Christians should simply turn their blind, a blind eye to the wars and to politics and the things going on into the world. I, I think we should do the opposite. I think we should be aware. I believe it's, it's to be a good citizen and a good Christian to know what's going on in the world 
in politics, with war, that way that we can know, that we can pray, that way we can minister. For instance, today, there are wars going on. Palestine and Israel, Ukraine and Russia. People are dying in war. But I know this, my God is still on his throne and he is in charge. But I would think and I, I know that we should continue to pray for those countries. But here in Genesis 14, there's this conflict between kings. The text says there's four kings against five. And, and all those jumbled up names, you, you kind of come out with this. Four kings Against five. In verses one and two, we see that there's a battle, and the four kings overcame the five kings. So we, we had this first war in the scripture, the, the first invasion of, of one kingdom over other kingdoms, the, the, the first um, occupancy, I guess you could say, of one kingdom uh, being in another kingdom, and this we see happened, and they ruled over these kingdoms. For 12 years. This is in life. This is in the Bible. Things often repeat themselves, don't they? Things repeat themselves. We see uh, that happen throughout the scriptures. Things repeat themselves. And I would akin to you that what's happening in Russia and Ukraine is similar to this. One kingdom trying to invade another kingdom and have them in captivity. So in this story, we have these four kingdoms over these five kingdoms, and they reigned over them for 12 years. But in the 13th year, the five kingdoms rebelled. They, they, they did not want to be under submission to the other kingdoms. So one year later, there's another war, and they're taken back into captivity so w w this is just to unpack what's going on here that that's the the conflict between these kingdoms ne next we'll notice in our passage the collateral damage of war it says in verse 11 so the enemy took all the possessions of sodom and gomorrah and all their possessions and went their way they also took lot the son of abram's brother who was dwelling in sodom and his possessions and went their way. So after this final battle, after, after all of that is over, the, the, the kingdoms that prevailed, they plundered Sodom and Gomorrah. They, in Sodom and Gomorrah, they took all their possessions, they took their wealth. It's likely what happens in, in many wars. But what they also took was Lot, who is Abraham's nephew. Now, who was this man, Lot, in the Bible? Well, we know this. Lot was a believer. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, Peter calls Lot righteous Lot. Now, he may have been a believer, but we don't see much evidence of that in the Scriptures, do we? He may be righteous Lot, but most often we see Lot in his failing. We do not see Lot worship God. We do, not, we do not see Lot pray to God. He does not build an altar as Abram does. We often see Lot in his failing. And rightly so. We see that in many today, right, as Christians. They may be born again, but they are not living for God as they should. Now Lot when he came to the promised land, he came with Abram, his uncle. And the story goes, once they got to the promised land, they had too many, uh, their livestock was, was too much that it couldn't support the land. So Abram, said, Abram tells Lot, Lot, if you choose this way, I'll go this way with my flock. If you choose this way, I'll go this way with my flock. So what did Lot do? He looked around. You know, you know how he decided which way to go? He found the land that was more bountiful and more green, what would profit him the most. 
You see, you see, Lot lived by sight and not by faith, where Abram lived by faith and not by sight. And, and so fast forward, the, the issue with the place that, that Lot chose, there's a problem. The, the, the place that Lot chose, there was a city near called Sodom. Now, Sodom's a bad place. Sodom's the place you don't want to live. You don't want your kids to live. You don't want your kids to go to school in this, this place called Sodom. Sodom's the town, when you're going on vacation, you go around Sodom to get where you want to go. If Sodom gets so bad, our God rains fire from heaven and destroys it. That's what we're talking about here. And so after these kings overcome the over king, these, these other kings, Lot is in this sinful city called Sodom, and he is captive. I submit to you, that is the consequence of him choosing to go live there. Because if, if Lot did not choose to live where he did, he would not have been in Sodom, and he would not have been taken into captivity. Now, something else about Lot, although Abram rescues him, where does Lot go back to? Sodom, right? He's in a sinful city, taken into captivity, rescued, and he goes back to a sinful city. Isn't that how many people are today? Many Christians? You, they're helped. They're saved out of a sinful lifestyle. You walk with them, and where do they go? Back into the sinful ways that they were. I mean, you can only help people so much. People make their own choices. Lot had his own choices. He, he, he could have... He could have moved, he could have sought help from Abram, but he chose to go back into his sin, this sinful place and be surrounded by sinful people. Oh, isn't it so much better to be amongst God's people, leading a good, holy life, even if it means less? Lot wanted more. He wanted more possessions, and he thought being here would give him more possessions, but I submit to you, it's better to have less and to live a good and holy, righteous life. Lot is the collateral damage to this war. Abram came to him. Abram helped him. And let's, let's read here in the following verses Abram's response to uh, his nephew's captivity, the courageous faith of Abram. Genesis 14, 13. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram and the, the Hebrew, and this is the first time the word Hebrew is mentioned in the Bible. It says, Who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eshcol and Aner? These were allies of Abram. And when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobat, north of Damascus. And he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and all the people. I have to admit, when I first read this, or sometimes when I read this, I think of a country song. And the, the singer's name is Tracy Lawrence. And the song is called, You Find Out Who Your Friends Are. Have you heard that song? And the song basically talks about when you were in need, when you run out of gas, when you, you have a flat tire, when it's at night, you really find out who your friends are. You're going to find out who is going to come and help you in your time. It, it, it goes like this. Somebody's going to drop everything. Run out and crank up their car. Hit the gas, get there fast. Never stop to think what's in it for me. I hope you have a, a friend like that. When it's 2 in the morning, you have a flat, when you need something, somebody that you can call. We need friends like that. But what's more better than a good friend? Family, right? Now you have a church family. It's, 
If it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you need something, you call me, okay? Or you call your Sunday school teacher. You can call them. They're there for you, too. But as a church family, we should be there for each other. And, and we are family, but Lot was also Abram's family. And Abram doesn't hesitate. He gets his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, men that he has raised from birth, born in his house. They are like sons to Abram. They're loyal and they're trained. Church, these are warriors. These are men who will lay down their life for Abram to rescue Lot. And 318 of them. Doesn't sound like a lot, right? But often battles are won before the war begins. What do I mean? I would rather have 318 trained men than 3,000 men who've never picked up a sword. But it's not just the training of these men. Abram, at 75 years old, goes to battle. How, don't raise your hand. How many here do we have 75 years old? Maybe a few, right? Could you imagine journeying, journeying traveling on a horse for miles and going to battle? But it's not just that he went to battle, he was prepared to battle, and he had a strategy. The, throughout the Bible, there, there's often plans and strategies, and, and many Christians, they think we should live this way. We should just be led by the Spirit. We'll live our life. God tells me to do something, I'll do it. Otherwise, so be it. I submit to you that we as a people, and especially as a church, we need to plan and strategize. If God intends for us to do something, if he wants, to go, wants us to go somewhere, we need to plan to accomplish those things. Abram needed to save his nephew Lot, and he strategized and planned. And what did he do? He divided up these 318 men. And he attacked at night, and he defeated the, the armies of four kings. What a, I wish we had more information about this battle. It, it would probably be awesome to know and to read more about it. But Abram was a man of faith. God promised Abram, I will bless you, and I will make a nation of you. You have many descendants, and I will give you a promised land. And Abram had faith in God and in that promise. And God has made promises to us too, right? He loves us. And he is there for us, but we must be people of faith, too, when we are going through the battles of life. As we close, I have this wonderful quote, author unknown, but I think it's so important when we are considering battles. It says, I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed and my future is secure. I'm finished and I'm done with low living, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk by patience, live by prayer, and labor by his power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few, my God reliable, and my mission clear. I cannot be bought, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. 
I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know and work till he stops me, and when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. Amen? As we close and we have this time of invitation, if you're not a child of God, you're not a Christian, I encourage you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. The scriptures say that we are saved by grace through faith. The gospel is that Jesus, uh, God, took on flesh. He gave his life. And through the death, burial, and resurrection, we place our faith in Jesus. He is the only way to heaven. And in placing our faith in him, we can receive eternal life. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, then the invitation, if you would come forward, I'd love to speak with you more about that. We'll be partaking in the communion in a moment. Something interesting about the story we just read. A few verses later, Abram is introduced to a man called King Melchizedek. And it says he, it says he brings bread and wine. So just a few verses later, Abram and a king have communion. Church, we're going to have communion. But before we do, we need to prepare our hearts. God, forgive us of our sin. Let's confess our sin. God, prepare us now. Let's pray.